Oasis Church. We're going to continue uh, our notes as Pastor Craig began for us today. And I just want to say, uh, how awesome is it that we live in a day and age where we can be united by technology with churches uh, all over the states, even around the world. And Life.Church, they are so, uh, not only the technology side, but they are so generous. They give all this away uh, for resources, for churches, for free. And so we love to work together. So they're on the same uh, series this week. Uh, many churches around the states are doing the same series as well. And now it's our turn also. So we're glad for that. Just a quick reminder. Uh, two weeks ago, we said this idea of traveling light. We want to let go of stuff. We want to let go of things that we've held on to in our closets, in our garages, things we haven't used in a while, and uh, we're just holding on to because we think we need it. And sometimes the reality is we think we have stuff, but sometimes our stuff has us. And so we want to be able to let go of some things, especially moving into a new year. Last week, we looked at the idea of distractions. We want to let go of distractions because uh, we believe, again, that Satan, our enemy, doesn't have to destroy us if he can distract us. If he can get us focused on things that really don't matter and, and focus on things that are time wasters or, or things that will cause us to miss the really valuable moments with our family, with our friends, just in life in general, then he's got us where he wants us. He, he gets us off the path of even following Jesus by distracting us. So we said, listen, maybe sometime, maybe even the next few weeks. Uh, we put our phone down more. We're more aware of how much time we're spending on different apps. We're more aware of the distractions in our life and want to be more mindful of those as we uh, not only celebrate Christmas, but move into 2019. Uh, today is the same exact thing. We want to be able to travel light. We want to be able to let go of some things. And we're talking today this idea of bitterness. We're talking this idea of, of things that have happened to us yesterday or last year or in the last decade even. And that we're still carrying with us. It's still part of our baggage. And the thing about uh, Christmas, the thing about the, the holidays, it tends to magnify our emotions. So if you've had a really great year, a really great month, a really great maybe last uh, several years, man, the holidays are awesome. It magnifies. You're able to enjoy it even more so. The lights are, are more beautiful. The cool, crisp weather. We're enjoying more. We're in our Christmas mood. We get to put on our Christmas boots or our Christmas sweater and not, not sweat to death. We're able to, to enjoy those things. Even the eggnog lattes taste even better when life is going well. The holidays magnify those things. But the flip side is also true. If it's been a rough week or month or season, or maybe even several years, then the holidays tend to magnify that, that hurt as well. Uh, we recognize and realize that there is family tension that we feel in August, but we feel it more in, in, in during the holidays. We feel it more in December. The relational hurts that we thought we were past now with rise to the occasions, we see them more often this time of year, and it's, it's real. The disappointments maybe even in our own self that we didn't do what we wanted to accomplish this year and we didn't achieve that goal. We feel that we're, the, the holidays tend to magnify these things. And so the really, really good things are better. The really, really tough things feel harder and we feel more pain in that. So here's what I just want to remind you as we kind of, as we're aware of that, part of that is just being aware of that as we move into this. In the next couple of days, you and I are going to have, especially as you're around your family more, uh, we're going to have more opportunities, God-given opportunities, uh, to share the good news about Jesus Christ. Many of us have family and friends who do not know the Lord as their personal Savior, do not, are not following Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so we have a chance to point them to where we get our hope from, uh, to where we're counting on and living our life through uh, the power, not of ourselves, but the, through the power and the ability of Jesus Christ on our behalf. And so we have a great opportunity to point people to Jesus uh, at this time, but we also have some great opportunities to, uh, to be aware of where the enemy might be trying to plant seeds of offense. And we have some great opportunities to put the truth that Pastor Craig just mentioned into practice. That you and I, we can't control what people do. You and I are going to be in situations where we can't control what the other person is going to say, uh, what their attitude will be like, what their response will be, what their reaction will be. We can't control other people. But you and I, we can, through the power of, of Christ, through the power of Jesus working in our, in our life, we can control how we respond. We can control how we react. We can control our attitude. We can control our speech. I mean, we can't control other people. That's where the frustration is. I just wish they would do this. I just wish they wouldn't react this way. I just wish they would just let it go. Right? We can't control what other people do, but we can control how we respond. Again, we're going to find out today, not in our own power, 
But if you're following Christ, you've been given a new heart. We have been given a new power. Uh, the Holy Spirit's able to allow us to live differently than we would without Christ. So we want to be mindful of that as well. So we're going to talk about bitterness. I know you woke up today, Dan, saying, Jeremy, it's a beautiful day. I hope we talk about bitterness. All right. So none of us really want to talk about this. All right. But it's so important for us. And it's so important, and I need to hear it twice because I spoke it on it already, and I need it again myself. So I know that we all deal with this in different ways. And so we want to talk about uh, bitterness. As Pastor Craig read in Hebrews uh, 12, uh, there's a couple of problems with bitterness. The first one is this. Bitterness has a dangerous root. Bitterness has a dangerous root. In Hebrews 12, uh, starting in verse 15, we read this. Look after each other. So that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. So the idea of watch out is a warning. Be aware. This can easily happen to every single one of us. Watch out. Be aware for this, uh, this root of bitterness because it's a poisonous root of bitterness. And we don't want these things growing up in our lives. Now, uh, I'm going to ask you a question, but it's not a trick question, all right? Where do roots grow? Above ground or underground? Ready? Where do they grow? Underground. Underground, all right? For the majority uh, of plants and, and living things, trees, they have roots that grow underground. Now, we have some roots out here, the oak tree, that are starting to pop up. We're able to see those and trip over those. So, uh, Kevin and Brenda, they're working on a deck. It's going to be amazing. And, and we're praying for no rain, but for that majority no rain this week to be able to finish that deck as, as they are working hard on that. But majority of time, the roots are under the ground. We don't see them growing, but they are there. And so even, again, in a gardening aspect, if you have weeds that begin to put down roots, obviously that seed is there, what starts it, but the roots are put down. But if you get those roots pretty quick, the weeds are able to be easily, uh, to be, uh, more e easily able to be removed. But if those weeds grow, those roots grow further down, they become more and more untangled, uh, entangled with the healthy stuff. It actually begins to affect those around it. The same is true for bitterness. Bitterness is an underground job. It, it happens beneath the surface of our lives and in our heart. And the reality is, you and I can pretend everything's okay on the outside. How's everything going? Things are great. Things are awesome. Everyone I see I interact with, I have a great time. I smile at everyone. But the bitterness can happen underground. And, and, and it, it can be hidden. It can be uh, easily glossed over that it's not that big of a deal. But all the time, this started, what started out as a seed has grown into roots. And those roots are getting stronger and stronger. You may not even know that offense has taken root. In that moment, you may not even be aware uh, of what really is going on in our lives. Because again, uh, it, it grows down deep uh, beneath, beneath the surface. Uh, you may not be aware of, of what something happened. So I, I saw a quote recently that I want to begin this part of discussion. I saw it, uh, a Rich Barrett, a local uh, pastor, pastor of Access Church. He posted this online yesterday. He said this, one solitary life can change the world. And so you're like, okay, that's inspirational. That's exciting. And then he says this, when you doubt this, just remember that stubborn driver in the left lane. All right. We can even put the stubborn, slow driver in the left lane, okay? So one solitary life can change the world. You can wake up, and man, everything is going great. You're excited. Woohoo! I only hit the snooze button once. It's going to be a good day, all right? You're on time. There's actually shampoo in the bottle, all right? So you're actually able to, uh, to take care of yourself, and, and, and you're looking good. Right, it's a good hair day, all right? The humidity's not great or, 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 or not that big of an issue this time. It's going to be an awesome day, and, and your family's actually in a good mood as they're getting ready for school. It's crazy, right? It's an amazing day that's happening. You get in the car, maybe you're even singing a little Christmas jingle on the way. Like you are in a good mood. It's exciting. You jump on 295. Or you jump on 95. And you're humming right along. Woo, it's going to be awesome. Traffic. No, no, no. I don't have to cross the Buckman Bridge today, so it's going to be fine. Buckman always has an issue. It's crazy, right? So we got that. I don't have to cross the Dave's Point Bridge today. We're going to be good, right? So then that person comes over in your lane. And here's the deal about Jacksonville, all right? The speed limit is 65. That means we go 75, just so you know, all right? Just 75 is the speed limit, just so you know. It says 65, we go 75, all right? So if you come over in the left lane, don't go the speed limit and don't go 60. 
Just so you know, right? Don't don't go below that. So you're cruising along, things are going great, and there's a person in front of you. And I love it because there's usually a person on their side of it too. And it might be a big semi truck, something like that, but they're going slow as well. And so you're like, Lord, I don't know what to do about this situation. It's been a good day, but my life is about to change because this person is coming my lane. And you know what? You know, you're, you're there, right? And you're, you know, you want to give grace, you know, for five seconds. All right, but then you're like, okay, the semi truck's gone. You can still get over, but you're still my lane. And you're still going 60. So you're, you're, you're wondering. And, and again, I, I'm confessing. My son's in the car with me. He's, he's a witness, right? He knows, right? These things, right? So sometimes you're like, you know what? I just want to get them over. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll just test the horn, right? Why? Because cars. They come with horns, right? And you, you got to test them every now and then. You don't want those things to die, and then you don't know it's not it's dead. It doesn't work, right? So you test, but it's a nice little oh, beep, you know, just a beep, you know, like you know. And my car, it's a it's a small car, so like you know, it's like not like that. So it's like not really, you know, scary anyway. So beep, you know, then you're like beep beep, you know, then like beep 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 beep, beep and then like come on, I don't get to that point, but it's the whole idea of when I can finally get around this person in the right lane, so I can pass them, even though they're in the passing lane. When I'm passing them, I just want to know, I hope that person has a great day. I, I hope that person, I just can't believe that. And here's the thing. What is that? That's a small thing, right? That's a seed. But here's the deal. Two miles later, I'm still thinking about it. Right? They're way back in the rear view. Like way back, right? Like because they're still going sixty, right? So, and then an hour later, sometimes we're still thinking about that. And, and, and several, maybe even, and then the next day we're dreading. Like, you know what? I left the same time. Maybe they left the same time. Maybe I'll see them again. Like, oh no, you're looking for that. You're like, kind of all that situation. You're kind of replaying that event in your mind. And here's the thing: that's a small thing. It's a seed. But we see people over and over again in the news with road rage. That seed didn't just start in that moment. That root's been growing a long time. My issue that I confess to you right now wasn't just one person. I've had this issue for a while. And that root is growing down, right? And it begins to affect us. It begins to affect even how we see those around us. And we, we kind of put people, listen, I don't care at all about this person. I just care that they're in my lane, right? And I miss the much bigger picture of what I'm called to be as a follower of Jesus and what I'm called to be as a, as a dad and what I'm called to be in this moment as I'm driving this. And so we really talk about bitterness and it kind of hits home for all of us. We want to go, okay, is there a root in my life? And what does that look like? Well, here's what bitterness looks like. Bitterness actually looks the opposite of love. It actually looks the opposite of love. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is writing to a church, a group of believers, who have been changed by love, by the love of God given to us through Jesus. And in turn, he says, because you've been changed by love, here's how you should love others. Here's what love looks like. Love is patient and kind. Bitterness is impatient. <laughs> get out of my way. <laughs> you know, other, get out of my way. Bitterness is impatient and rude. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but love rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful, and love endures through every circumstance. Bitterness is the opposite. Bitterness is impatient. <coughs> Bitterness is jealous. Bitterness is boastful. Bitterness is rude. Bitterness always demands its own way. Bitterness is irritable, and bitterness keeps record of being wrong. Here's the thing, when you and I are bitter and that root has got a hold, man, we keep detailed records. Like, I know exactly what that person said to me. I know the time. It was 317. It was raining outside, and I didn't have a good hair day. That did not help, just so you know. And so we have all these details, right, about these offenses. And bitterness keeps this record of how you hurt me, how long ago you hurt me, and what you said, and I just still... And holding on to the, that root is growing down deep. And it's affecting our heart because it's a poisonous root. So here's the thing. The longer, the longer we allow the root to live, the more it spreads and the harder it is to kill. The longer we let this root of bitterness get a hold of our heart, the more it spreads. Uh, roots spread around, and they affect other living things around us. 
they, they affect other living things in the garden. And we just realize, okay, it's, it's going to be more difficult. If I had just pulled this room and this offense was small, it would be much easier to get rid of. But this has been here for, for several days, for several weeks, for several years. It's going to be harder to pull that root and to kill the bitterness that's got a hold of our lives. Not only does bitterness have a dangerous root, but secondly, bitterness produces a poisonous fruit. Bitterness produces that poisonous fruit. It says in Hebrews 12, 15, again, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Again, there's roots of one tree, but that one tree produces many fruits. And so again, just an analogy of a fruit tree, many people can take that fruit and enjoy it as an impact. If it's a bad tree, uh, people get sick of that fruit. If it's a good tree, people enjoy the benefits of that. So the same thing is true for our lives, that we're affecting those around us with our bitterness. If we let this root get a hold of our heart and it's in us, sooner or later it comes out and it corrupts whatever is around us. We've been a part of a small group of people a life group who say, you know, we're going to get together for a couple of weeks or, or months. We're going to pray for each other. We're going to go through the word of God. And yet we've seen a bitter person can get in that group or be part of that group. And it ruins relationships around. It, it, it distrust builds and discord builds because there's a poisonous root at work and it affects those around us. We can see a, a workplace where everyone's on board and loves, uh, lo loves the team, loves the company except one bitter person. I can't believe they came up with this manual. I can't believe the boss wants me to do this. I can't believe this detail. And this bitterness affects the morale of the whole business. Affects the morale of the whole team. And it, it, it corrupts those around us. We've seen again even in the holidays, a bitter person can divide a family. Man, is that person going to be there? Oh, no. All right, we have in-laws, we have outlaws, we have family and, and, and blood and, and paper, all right? That's how, by marriage, that's how we do that, right? So we kind of talk about these things, and are they going to be there? Oh, no. And we recognize that that bitterness that, that either they bring to the table and corrupts us, or because we're bitter at them, we're now affecting our family, and we're letting that get a hold of this. And so I know that some of you are thinking, you know what, Jeremy, I'm so excited you're teaching about this. Uh, I'm going to get the YouTube link for it. And I'm going to sit down with my family. I'm going to say, before we have Christmas dinner, we're going to watch this quick video from our teaching this past, year, this past week from Pastor Jeremy about bitterness. I, I want you to know this is for you. Uh, you're already in mind thinking of somebody that you want to share this with, all right? That you want to pass this on. I just want to encourage you. Before we pass it on to someone else, what if we need this ourselves? What, what if we need this to internalize this on our own? Because here's the thing. Bitterness, I said, grows underground. It can grow so deep underground that we don't even see it in our own life. Bitterness is really easy to see in someone else. Yeah, that person's bitter. Yeah, that person's angry. Bitterness is one of the most difficult sins to see in the mirror. To look and go, oh, wait, oh, I, oh I'm bitter. Oh, I have the seed of offense that I thought wasn't a big deal, but I thought about it last six weeks in a row, it's a big deal. And it's growing deep and it's getting a hold of my heart. And so we want to challenge you to be aware of this. And the thing that reason makes it difficult for us to see is because we're justified to hold on to our bitterness. All right, if someone else is bitter, you guys just need to let it go. But if we're bitter, like, no, 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 it hurt me. I'm just, I have the right to hold on to this. I have the right to think about this. I have the right to fall over this over and over again. I have the right. And it's really difficult for us to see that. Unless we're, care, unless we're careful, unless we get rid of it now, we're not going to trap a light in this area. We're going to add to our baggage in this area. And unless we watch out for this, we could celebrate Christmas. We could celebrate Christ at Christmas. We could celebrate all that Jesus has done for us and still hate someone in our hearts. Jesus, thank you for coming. Thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you again, God, that you sent your son to love us. Thank you so much for Christmas. I love you. Thank you, Lord. You're so good. But I hate that person. And we can do, we got to watch out for that. We don't want to carry this into the holidays and then carry it into a new year. We can be so grateful as we begin a new year for grace. God, I feel you so many times in 2018. God, thank you for another year. Thank you for how your mercies are new every day. God, thank you for your amazing grace. And we want to receive grace, but don't want to give grace to those who offended us. So I want to challenge us. How can we travel light? What do we need to do to, to be aware of this? And maybe just even right now, I, I, we're, we're asking God, God, show us. Is there bitterness in my heart? God, point out the grudge. Point out the poisonous root. Point out the hurt 
that I've been carrying. Because God, I don't want to carry this any further. And I want to encourage you to have that be your prayer even right now as, as we wrap up and as we, as we move toward the end. And you might say, okay, Jeremy, there is a root there. How do I kill it? How do I get rid of it? Well, the good news is that it's possible. The gospel is such that uh, even though we've been identified by a sin or by identified by a controlling issue in our life, that no longer has the final say. Because of Jesus, he has the final say in our life no matter what. And because of Jesus, we're able to find power and strength to turn to Him and, and follow His example and, and see how we can find freedom in this area of well. So how do we kill the root of bitterness? Ephesians 4, 31-32, Paul writes to a church in the church of Ephesus, and he says this, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Now again, let me just pause. Paul is speaking to a group of believers. So he's not just saying, just try really hard. He's not saying, just grit your teeth and like, you know, we're going to make it through Christmas. Urgh, I'm not going to say anything. In your own human strength and in your own human power, you get rid of bitterness. No, he's saying, no, no, because of Christ, because you've been given a new heart, because you've been given to a, a new life, you have a connection with God, a relationship with God, because of all who God is. Because the grave that used to hold Jesus is empty. Jesus is alive and actively involved in our world, in our lives. Because of the gospel, what is old has become new, what is dead has been raised life. Because all this has happened in your heart, now we can get rid of bitterness. Because the Holy Spirit's at work in our lives, now we don't have to be identified by our rage or anger. Because the Holy Spirit is, is active in our, even in our words, we can put aside harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Because we're following Christ, we can get rid of these things. But I love how it doesn't just say get rid of, but it also has something to put in its place instead. You know, if you pull the roots out you know, of a garden, it leaves a hole there. You either need to put dirt in it or put something healthy, a healthy plant in its place. The same thing is true here. We're told to get rid of bitterness, but here we got to put something in its place. So get rid of all bitterness and instead be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And so we realize again that, that, that Paul gives us a direction. That we're going to get rid of something, we're going to pull that root, and we're going to fill it with something else. We're going to fill it, we're going to kill bitterness, first of all, with compassion. We're going to kill bitterness with compassion. We see that Paul teaches a similar principle in Romans 12, 21. It says this, Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Don't let evil, don't let poison, don't let bitterness conquer you. But instead, we're going to conquer evil. We're going to conquer that, that, that poison that's got a hold of our heart. We're going to conquer bitterness by doing good. Again, it's an opposite Instead of doing this, we're going to walk this direction. And we can only walk a different direction because of Christ at work in our life. Only the power of the Holy Spirit are we able to live differently than what we've lived before. Again, this right here reminds us, I can't control other people. Evil is going to happen. Sin, we will be sinned against. We will be offended. I can't control that. I can't control them. However, I can control myself. I can respond to their evil by not giving evil back. I can respond to their offense by not offending them back. I can respond to them being in, my, in the left lane without and me losing it, okay? I can control and conquer evil by doing good. We can do the opposite because of what Christ has done for us. In fact, Jesus said this as well. Jesus gives a truth reminder of this as well. Here's what he says in Luke chapter 6, verse 28. This is Jesus. He says, bless those who, who, who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. This is Jesus. Jesus who, who dealt with all of our offenses. Dealt with all of our sins. If anyone would have been justified to hold a grudge, it would have been Jesus because he paid for all the sins of all the world while committing no sin of his own. And Jesus says, listen, if you're a follower of me, you will be cursed. If you're living as a human being, you will be offended. So, bless those who curse you. And then he goes further. Pray for those who hurt you. 
pray for those who hurt you. One of the best ways to show compassion is to pray for someone who has hurt you. One of the best ways to show kindness is to pray for someone who hurt you. One of the best ways for your heart to go from poison to tender heart is to pray for someone who hurt you. And here's the prayer we don't pray. We don't pray, God, get him. God is going to be awesome. Send some lightning down. It's going to be a hallelujah. It's going to be amazing. We're not praying that prayer, okay? But we're praying, God, this person hurt me. Maybe they've been hurt. God, whatever they're going through, God, would you just fill that need? God, this person is traveling really slow in my lane. Maybe they're distracted. Maybe they had a rough email. Maybe they got a, some bad news. I don't know, but God, you do. And it, instead of that, that offense taking place and, and owning our heart, Jesus says, pray for those yes. who hurt you. Yes. So the family, again, God, this person, they've, they've had so much issues in their lives, so much difficulties. God, would you just meet them in a personal way this holiday? God, use me somehow to point them to you. Amen. To pray for those who hurt you. Here's the thing. Prayer for others may or may not change them. But prayer for others always changes us. And allows us to go, God, you, you've given me grace. God, help me to give grace to them. God, maybe they've hurt because they've been, they've been hurt. Maybe they say these things because of what was said to them. Maybe they treat people because of how they've been treated. God, break the cycle and use me somehow to, buy, to give healing to them, to bring healing to their life. And as we pray for them, we realize, okay, it may not change them, but it's going to change us. It's really hard to hate someone and pray for them. That's just the way that God works in our heart. His prayer is about love. Prayer is about saying, God, I want, I want them to see you more than making sure I'm taken care of it and my, offen my offenses are made right. And it's a bigger issue that we see. And sometimes we, we forget that. I know that I do. I forget that. Because I look only at the offense and I miss the person. And who does God love? People. And who does God desire that we would love? People. Be mindful of that. And so we want to get rid of bitterness and instead compassion, kindness, tenderheartedness. And then secondly, we want to kill bitterness with forgiveness. We want to kill bitterness with, bitterness with forgiveness. Now I know, again, I, I've shared some really simple things. And you might think, Jeremy, you're pretty petty. Yes, correct. You're right. I'm, I'm petty. We talk about forgiveness and I know, again, in our, in our family, church family, in our congregation, talk about forgiveness, and it's simply this first, Jeremy, you had no idea how much this person hurt me. Talk about forgiveness. You're saying there's no way I can forgive that. And maybe again, this whole time, God has brought this person to your mind, and, and you've been replaying that over and over again. And we're not just talking about words, we're talking about actions that were done to you, by, maybe by a family member. And things that are so deep, and, 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 and the scars are so real, and you're saying, there is no way, you have no idea what they did to me. And the truth of the matter is, you're right. I have no idea what's been done to you. And forgiveness is difficult no matter what. But I believe there's no other way to freedom until you forgive. Yes, yes. Until you're willing to bring that before God and trust Him with it. And where you decide in your heart, I'm going to let this go. I'm going to forgive. Forgiveness is the hardest muscle to exercise. But it's so important. And this is true for every single one of us. Every age. Every one of us. To learn to forgive. A couple of weeks ago, we, we, in our At the Movie series, we looked at a movie called I Can Only Imagine. And we saw a, a boy who was raised by an abusive father. And when he was able to leave after high school, he left and just said, There's, I'm out. I'm, no more connection, no more relationship with you as my dad. But there was a brokenness. He had separated his life between how he was around everyone else and how he was around his dad. And basically, he was challenged. He said, you've got to make this right. You've got to get your life whole. You've got to let go of this bitterness and pull out this root. So he decides to go back home. And Bart is the name of the boy that was now a young man. Goes back home and finds that his dad, who used to be abusive, used to hate God, has now met Jesus. Has now been changed from the inside out. 
And he's received God's forgiveness, but Bart is unwilling to forgive his dad, at least at the beginning. We see this process of him being willing to open up his heart to forgive his dad and to let his dad off the hook for offenses that happened years ago. And so in that teaching, we said, well, here's a couple things. When we talk about forgiveness, here's what forgiveness is not. All right. First of all, forgiveness is not conditional. Forgiveness is that is not saying, okay, before we eat our Christmas dinner, if this person says they're sorry, then I'll forgive them. That's a condition. And quite honestly, that condition may never be met. So forgiveness is saying, okay, it's not based on if they do something. It's something that I decide to do right now in this moment or right then in that moment. I'm going to choose to forgive. It's not conditional. It's a choice that we make. Again, it's the hardest muscle to exercise. Forgiveness is not minimizing the offense. Again, going back to what I just said, that I, I, Jeremy, you have no idea what I've been through. You're right. But forgiveness is not saying it wasn't a big deal. Okay, forgiveness is acknowledging, no, no, what you did, did hurt. And I have borne that pain for a while. I have carried that hurt with me for a while. It is not minimizing the offense. Oh, it wasn't a big deal. It's acknowledging, no, it is a big deal. But I'm still going to forgive this person. Forgiveness is not forgetting what happened. Forgiveness is not just deleting it from your memory. Woo, it's gone. Now I forget it. I forget and forget. Okay? That's not reality. Because our mind loves to replay things over and over and over again. Forgiveness is not forgetting what happened. Forgiveness is a choice that we choose to make. We're going to get rid of bitterness and we're going to plant kindness. We're going to get rid of that poisonous root and instead we're going to plant forgiveness. And it's a choice we choose. It's not conditional. It's not saying it wasn't a big deal. And it's not forgetting. But it's something we exercise over and over and over again. And so how do we do this? Well, we go back to Ephesians. And we see again what Paul reminds us. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, if only we had an example of that. Oh yeah, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. You see, if we've been forgiven by Jesus, we have an example of how we're to forgive others. How did Jesus forgive us? Did he wait till we confessed our sin? No. Nope. That's a condition. Jesus gave love unconditionally. Did Jesus minify, minimize the offense of our sin? No. Nope. It cost Jesus his life. Our sin had a heavy debt and it required a strong, uh, a miraculous payment. And God gives that in His Son, Jesus. Does forgive, forgiveness mean that God forgot what happened? No. He knew we were sinners. He knew we sinned against God. And He allowed us to be forgiven of our sin. How did Jesus forgive? He gave freely. He forgave generously. He forgave absolutely. He forgave entirely and without condition. This is how Jesus forgave us. So in turn, we're to forgive others. Because we've been forgiven, we can forgive others. Because God has set us free, we can find freedom and forgiveness of others. Here's the deal. Again, we go back to how much did God forgive us. With that example, we're able to forgive others. Here's what's so important. To forgive a person is to set a prisoner free and to discover that the prisoner was actually us. We were the prisoner. When we offer forgiveness, we think, okay, I'll let you off the hook. But we're actually letting ourselves off the hook. Again, that seed of offense, that person planted that offense, and they're gone. They're moving on. They're on to the next thing. They're on to the next thing. We're the ones who have held on to that. We're the ones who have replayed that over and over again. In fact, many of us, if we were talking about that, they wouldn't even remember what they did. And we've replayed it over and over again. So when we forgive someone, we think, okay, I'm letting them off the hook, but actually, we're setting ourselves free. That root wasn't affecting them, it's affecting us. We pull that root of bitterness out, we pull that poison out. We realize, okay, now I can be, kind of become more spiritually healthy. Now I can become more, again, what God would have for me to do and to live and to say. Now, I can't control other people. I can control myself. Through the power of God, the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, what is self-control? Begin to know how am I going to respond? How have I been set free? 
Now I say it again, forgiveness is a muscle. So we can forgive in this moment. But in an hour, we might need to forgive again. And, 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 a, and a, tomorrow morning, we might need to forgive again. And, and by Wednesday, we might need to forgive again. Because here's the thing. If we have that person in our life, we're going to see them again. Offenses will come again. So we want to say, okay, everything up to December 22nd, or December, what day is today? The 16th, <laughs> forgive me. 17th, I'm going to forgive again. 18th, I'm going to forgive again. Whether they did something or not, because we're going to play it again. We're going to be tempted to, I'm not that, let's just let that root grow some more. No, no, no. Pull it out. Get rid of bitterness. Rage, anger, harsh words. Instead, be kind, tender hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven us. I can't control others, but I can't control how I respond. In Romans 12 18, it says this Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Do all that is in your control to live in peace with everyone. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. I know we'd love to go back to our old way before Christ and, and we love to relish that bitterness, but let go. Travel light. Unpack that. Let's leave that here at the cross in this moment. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father God, as we close this time, I know we covered a lot. And I know, again, talking about it takes a few minutes, but living it can be a lot more difficult. But God, as we close today, we close by saying, you're the one who's able. You're the one who's strong when we are weak. You're the one who lives in us as we're following you and trusting in you. And you're the one who gives us the ability to love, to forgive, to be kind, to set free. Because, God, you've forgiven us and set us free. For those of us who are following you this morning, God, I pray that we would, again, be mindful of all you've done for us and apply your truth to our life in this way, this week, and beyond. 